essay three of idle hours in a library by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain essay three two novelists of the english restoration part two these seven stories therefore are anything but pleasant reading unless they be like certain incidents referred to in the new atlantis pleasant to the ears of the vicious it is not only that they are repulsive because of the undisguised licentiousness that everywhere prevails in them they are occasionally disgusting on account of the large part played by the merely horrible so intimately related are unemotionalized passion and utter brutality that as might be expected here where the one is so conspicuous the other has considerable place the revenge taken by the woman upon her worthless husband in the wife's resentment did recollection of her own wrongs add bitterness to rivella's pen we may well wonder may be cited as an example of this don rodrigo a spanish gentleman after trying for fifteen months to seduce a poor girl named violenta marries her in a moment of thoughtlessness but keeps the marriage a secret from his friends before long he is forced by his family into a second and public union with a wealthy heiress the news of his inconstancy fills violenta with delirious passion and nothing will appease her but revenge sudden and complete she decoys rodrigo into her apartment murders him while he is asleep and not contented with this deliberately tears out his eyes and mangles his body all over with an infinite number of gashes before throwing it out into the street and what is particularly noteworthy is that the narrator herself does not seem to be in the least impressed by the loathsome details accumulated in her description she reports the incident as though it were a matter of course and quietly tells us that when violenta was brought to justice for her crime the duke the magistrates and all the spectators were amazed at the courage and magnanimity of the maid and that one of so little rank should have so great a sense of her dishonour unquestionably the most pleasing of all these stories alike from a literary and from a moral standpoint is the happy fugitives a simple tale containing comparatively little to which exception could be taken the plots of the physician stratagem and the perjured beauty on the other hand are too hideous to be reproduced as a whole the book is desperately dull and tiresome for the pornographic horrors of its pages are unredeemed by any excellencies of style its only interest for us here therefore is an historic one and about this side of the matter we shall have a general word or two to say later on if morally considered she is equally open to stricture our second woman novelist mrs bain at least bulks out as a more considerable figure in the annals of english letters highly eulogized by some of the most distinguished of her contemporaries dryden otway and southern among the number she must still be spoken of with the respect due to her undoubted talents versatility industry and courage that she is to be regarded as an honor and glory to her sex as one of her enthusiastic admirers roundly declared it would now for many reasons be out of the question to maintain but the one fact that she was the first woman of her country to support herself entirely by the pen itself establishes her right to a certain place in the long line of female writers who have since her day done so much for literature afra or afara johnson afterwards bain known as the divine astrea in the exuberant language of the time and long commonly referred to as an extraordinary woman was born towards the end of the reign of charles i while still a girl she was taken to the west indies by her father who had been appointed lieutenant-general of Suriname johnson himself died at sea and never arrived to possess the honor designed him but the family settled in the colony a land flowing with milk and honey they are said to have found it and continued to reside there till about sixteen fifty three 
a high-colored description of her life abroad is given in her best-known work as it was during this period that she made her hero's acquaintance and became interested in the story of his love and tragic fate it is characteristic of the tendencies of the age that her biographer should feel it necessary to pause at this point in her narrative to contradict some current town gossip about the kind of relationship which had existed between astrea and the african prince returning to england she married a man named bain who seems to have been a merchant in the city though of dutch extraction but concerning whom our information is of the most meagre sort of him we hear little or nothing in connection with aphra's subsequent adventurous career and she was a widow before sixteen sixty six attached to the court of charles the second she attracted so much attention we are told by her keenness of intellect alertness and wit that she was employed by the merry monarch in some delicate diplomatic affairs during the dutch war this took her to antwerp in the character of a spy in which capacity she succeeded so well that in course of time and by means principally of her innumerable love intrigues she obtained possession of some secrets of considerable value they are mistaken who imagine that a dutchman can't love remarks her biographer in commenting upon these incidents for though they are generally more phlegmatic than other men yet it sometimes happens that love does penetrate their lump and dispense an enlivening fire now and then with disastrous results as we perceive her information however was neglected by the english government and in disgust the patriotic lady threw up politics and diplomacy altogether and presently returned to london narrowly escaping death by shipwreck on the way once more in london mrs bain now thrown entirely upon her own resources turned to her pen for the means of support and thenceforth continued to occupy herself with literature and pleasure till her death in sixteen eighty nine say what one may about the general quality of her work its total amount remains remarkable especially when one takes into consideration the conditions of poverty failing health and many harassing distractions under which it was produced for a number of years with unabated industry but varying success she poured out plays which were calculated in style and morality to hit the prevailing taste and so boldly did she meet her masculine rivals on the common ground of licentiousness that she earned for herself the highly significant nickname of the female witcherly miscellaneous tracts and translations kept her busy in the intervals of dramatic activity during which time she also threw off a couple of very curious treatises the characters of which are perhaps sufficiently indicated by their titles the lover's watch or the art of making love and the lady's looking-glass to dress herself by or the whole art of charming all mankind as manuals of conduct it is to be feared that these lucubrations hardly tend to edification finally to leave out for the moment what is of course for us now the most important item her experiments in fiction which we will deal with by themselves mrs bain also managed to write and publish a good deal of verse as work actually done this must be mentioned because it swells her account but it may be said at once that most of it and particularly her one ambitious effort the allegorical voyage to the isle of love is without value or interest here and there in her plays however she touches a true poetic note as in the really fine song in abdelazar for which though it is doubtless familiar to readers of the anthologies space may be found here love in fantastic triumph sate whilst bleeding hearts about him flowed for whom fresh pains he did create and strange tyrannic power he showed from thy bright eyes he took his fires which round about in space he hurled but twas from mine he took desires enough to undo the amorous world from me he took his sighs and tears from thee his pride and cruelty from me his languishment and fears and every killing dart from thee thus thou and i the god have armed and set him up a deity 
but my poor heart alone is harmed while thine the victor is and free her biographer tells us that mrs bain was a woman of sense and by consequence mark the consequence a lover of pleasure as indeed it is added all both men and women are though some would be thought above the conditions of humanity and place their chief pleasure in a proud vain hypocrisy it needs hardly be said here that i am not at all concerned to defend the character of astrea's life or the tone of her writings and at this time of day any denunciation of the one or the other would surely be a work of supererogation but we should at least try to be fair in our judgments and if the very flattering description given by one of the fair sex who knew her intimately is even approximately correct she must have been generous frank and thoroughly good-hearted these are not bad qualities in a world which in practice knows only too little about them though we might hesitate to add with her anonymous friend that being thus endowed she was i am satisfied a greater honour to her sex than all the canting tribe of dissemblers that die with a false reputation of saints so far as her writings themselves are concerned it has only to be said that when she found herself dependent for a livelihood upon her talents and industry she took what seemed to be the shortest and easiest way open to success and undertook to produce just what the reading public of her day was most willing to pay for and the reading public of her day was unfortunately ready to pay highest for the most wanton and scandalous things herein she was neither better nor worse than the majority of her contemporaries who like her wielded the professional pen though the fact that she was a woman undoubtedly adds anusness to her offence against the ordinary decencies of life let any one of common sense and reason she says in her own defence and the circumstance that like dryden and others she was driven into explanation and apology is noteworthy read one of my comedies and compare it with others of this age and if they find one word which can offend the chastest ear i will submit to all their peevish cavils this is the familiar argument however bad i may be my neighbours are a trifle worse i should be very sorry for mrs bain's sake to take up her challenge sorrier for my own to have it supposed that what has been said above was said in the way of palliation or excuse mrs bain wrote foully and this for most of us and very properly is an end of the whole discussion but it is as idle in these matters of sentiment taste expression as it is elsewhere to ignore in any final judgment the subtle but profound influence of the time spirit and though we may regret that such a distinction should have to be made we must still in common fairness remember that mrs bain was a woman of the seventeenth century and not of our own generation but we must now turn to her novels her incomparable novels as they used to be called the collected edition of seventeen o five containing according to its own statement all the histories and novels written by the late ingenious mrs bain includes besides the two treatises to which reference has been made the following stories the history of oronoco or the royal slave the fair jilt the nun agnes de castro the lucky mistake memoirs of the court of the king of bantam and the adventure of the black lady the first mentioned of these oronoco the novel with which mrs bain's name is to-day almost exclusively associated is from every point of view by far the most interesting of her works it represents the first really noteworthy experiment in the fiction of the time to descend from the misty realms of the old romance to the plain ground of actual life the history which as miss kavanagh has said is the only one of her tales that despite all its defects can still be read with entertainment was written at the special request of charles the second to whom mrs bain on her return from the west indies had given so pleasant and rational an account of his affairs there and particularly of the misfortunes of oronoco that he desired her to deliver them publicly to the world 
the narrative is indeed represented by the author as a direct transcript from her own experiences i was she says myself an eye-witness to a great part of what you will hear fine set down and what i could not be witness of i received from the mouth of the chief actor in this history the hero himself the motive of the story is the tragedy of orunoko's life and this is worked out simply but with a good deal of power the grandson of an african king and a youth of great strength courage and intelligence orunoko early becomes enamoured of emoinda a beauty that to describe her truly one need only say she was female to the noble male but to whom unfortunately his grandfather also takes a fancy the young people are secretly married notwithstanding which the old king has the girl carried to his palace and placed among his mistresses in desperation the husband makes his way by night to imoinda's chamber here he is discovered by the king's guards imoinda is sold into slavery and after a while orunoko shares the same fate a lion taken in a toil by a remarkable coincidence they are brought at length to the same place the colony where aphra and her family were then living thus unexpectedly reunited to the woman he had deemed lost to him forever orinoco is for a time contented with his lot but presently growing weary of captivity he plans a revolt among the slaves upon the suppression of which he is brutally punished after this he escapes to the woods with his young wife whose fidelity and never-failing devotion are very touchingly set forth then comes the final tragedy dreading that she may fall into the hands of the whites he deliberately and with her full consent murders her and after remaining for several days half insensible beside her corpse he is again taken by the colonists and hacked to pieces limb by limb with his death the simple story ends now in the first and casual reading of this novel we may very probably be struck rather by its points of similarity to the older romances than by its qualities of essential difference from them for mrs bain frequently adopts the heroic or a big bow wow strain especially in her sentimental situations and where she desires to be particularly effective her language is often stilted and conventional and there are occasions when we are more than half convinced that surinam is after all only another way of spelling arcadia but further study of the work will convince us that we must not attach too much importance to what are really superficial characteristics in the deeper matters of substance and purpose the story belongs not to the old school of fiction but to the new and that mrs bain herself understood what she was about is i think made clear by what she says in the opening paragraph i do not pretend in giving you the history of this royal slave to entertain my reader with the adventures of a feigned hero whose life and fortunes fancy may manage at the poet's pleasure nor in relating the truth designed to adorn it with any accidents but such as arrived in earnest to him and it shall come simply into the world recommended by its own proper merits and natural intrigues there being enough of realities to support it and to render it diverting without the addition of invention two points then are noticeable in this work in the first place it depends for its interest not on astonishing adventures high-flown diction or extravagant play of fancy but rather on the sterling humanity of the narrative the unfortunate hero and his wife are of course drawn upon the heroic scale but they still possess the solid traits of real manhood and womanhood and applying the supreme test in all such cases we find that we can believe in them the chasm which separates such an achievement as this from the windy sentimentalities of the anglo-french romances is a very wide one and mrs bain's boldness of innovation was therefore the more remarkable in the second place orinoco is written with a well-defined didactic aim it is a novel with a purpose the remote forerunner of uncle tom's cabin and the whole modern school of ethical fiction thus together with a marked tendency towards realism mrs bain's book exhibits a no less marked bias in the direction of practical teaching 
its historic significance is therefore twofold mrs bain's other tales show less originality and are neither so attractive nor so valuable they are short love stories which though not so radically and aggressively impure as her plays are still tainted through and through by the prevailing grossness of the time like mrs manley mrs bain makes mere physical appetite the passion which rages beyond the inspirations of a god all soft and gentle and reigns more like a fury from hell the turning point of all her plots like mrs manley she centres the entire interest of her narratives in the gratification not in the influences of this passion like mrs manley too and here the severest judgment might well pass unprotested she is as harsh and free-spoken as the most profligate of male cynics regarding the foibles of her own sex vain selfish salacious intriguing spiteful her female figures as a whole are simply repulsive in their unqualified animality and as we read of their lives and their doings we no longer wonder at the open savagery of a witcherly or the undisguised contempt of a congreve in an age when a woman could thus write of women without fear almost without reproach finally like mrs manley mrs bain is ready at times to indulge not only in scenes of the utmost coarseness but also in pictures of the most revolting brutality an instance of this might be given from the fair jilt where the unskilful execution of tarquin is detailed with horrible minuteness the best of these shorter stories is the lucky mistake a tale written throughout with comparatively good taste they are merely all based on fact many on direct observation and this renders them from a student's point of view interesting but there is a great sameness in the incidents described and on the side of characterization they are very weak indeed the plots are all made up out of the same classes of material and the men and women of any one story are hardly to be distinguished otherwise than by name from those of any other and now in returning to the question of the historic significance of the two writers into whose books habitually allowed to stand undisturbed upon the library shelf we have here rather rashly ventured to pry we shall find if i mistake not that little remains to be said brief as our analysis of the heroic romances and the tales of mrs bain and mrs manley has necessarily been it will if it does not fail entirely of its purpose suffice to mark the points of fundamental contrast between them the nature and importance of the changes exemplified in these story-tellers of the restoration will thus be made clear hitherto as we have seen fiction had made little or no attempt to deal frankly with life in other words it had not as yet found its proper sphere purely a thing of the imagination it had sought its subjects afar proudly ignoring the common matters of the world the joys and sorrows the hopes and struggles of everyday humanity the words which the author of a life of sydney prefixed to one of the early editions of the arcadia applies to that work we might with equal fairness apply to almost the entire mass of fiction thus far written the invention is wholly spun out of the fancy he says the scene was laid in some far-away dreamland and the less remote and visionary because occasionally called by a familiar earthly name the characters were swollen out to superhuman proportions and were endowed with qualities that no mortal being has ever been known to possess their adventures were on the face of them impossible they thought acted talked as no man or woman had thought acted talked since the world began life and fiction stood entirely apart the real world of tangible flesh and blood found for the time its only expression in the drama in the fiction there was as yet no human interest whatever with mrs bain commenced the tendency to deal with life to make the novel in some sense a reproduction of actual experiences 
we may regret that the special phases of the human comedy that she deliberately chose to write about were only too often phases the least worthy of attention that her interests were narrowed down and her work crippled by considerations of the most cramping and disastrous kinds that she knew nothing of proportion and perspective and little of the higher and finer developments of motive and character that she could not see life steadily and did not see it whole but all this must not stand in the way of our insisting that she was one of the first writers of prose fiction perhaps the first in england to substitute the solid stuff of reality for the flimsy material of the imagination crude and partial as her observations were she at least observed sorry as are most of the results of her study of the world she did study it at first hand did hold the mirror up to nature what she accomplished in thus opening up the field of the modern novel what mrs manley accomplished in following her lead are matters therefore of sufficient importance to call for distinct recognition we do not claim for the books of these two women any individual merit or interest but when we lay aside one of their stories bearing in mind the conditions of the time at which it was written we realize that artistically if not always morally they represent a step in advance that it was by such work as this poor and hopelessly dull as it may seem to us to-day that the folios of la calpeneda and descutery were overthrown the way made clear for defoe and richardson and the foundations of modern fiction firmly laid but now let us notice the suggestive circumstances that like nearly all innovators these first realists seriously overstepped the mark in their early attempts to exchange fairyland for the actual world we find too large a place given to fact in the most hard and circumscribed sense of the word in place of pure fancy they sought to give absolute and undiluted reality in place of a picture without existing counterpart they strove to secure the detailed verisimilitude of a photograph indeed for a time the aims and methods of fiction were almost entirely lost sight of and it is easy to see how this unfortunate result was brought about weary of the conventionalities of the old romances and of the shadowy heroes and heroines with whose tedious adventures and even more tedious disquisitions their pages were filled the novelists of the restoration made a bold endeavor to get back to the life with which they were familiar and to deal with the world as they knew it to exist but for the moment there seemed only one way of doing this instead of fancy they must have fact instead of wandering off into the impossible they must limit themselves to the things which had actually happened which had really in charles reed's witty phrase gone through the formality of taking place hence for the present the constructive work of the imagination which some of us in these days of so-called naturalism are still old-fashioned enough to hold essentially important was almost entirely neglected nearly every story was statedly founded on fact and the business of the novelist was practically reduced to the task of presenting with but slight embellishment or rearrangement specific occurrences in life thus we have an early example of the tendency uh, just now so conspicuous towards what m brunetiere has happily called reportage in literature in the reaction against the school of heroic romance the new story writers therefore went to the other extreme to take the materials of familiar existence and to reorganize them thus producing a work of art which is at once all compact of truth and imagination was for the time being beyond their ken to their limited view realism meant slavish reality it was only after this mistake had been made that the possibility of avoiding the airy unrealities of old romance without being bound down to the skeleton facts of life gradually became apparent the discovery that a writer could be true to experience and human nature without necessarily reproducing actual events or photographing individual men and women was the outcome of many experiments and much failure and was at length hit upon in a half-blind and fortuitous way 
it was only little by little that the element of acknowledged fiction was allowed to encroach upon the domain of truth only little by little that people began to understand that the art of fiction and the art of lying are not one and the same and that the boldest play of imagination in the treatment of life is not always to be associated with the distortion of reality in the works of mrs manley and mrs bain we see the english novel stumbling painfully towards the comprehension of its own objects we have reached firm ground and that is a great achievement for only when we move on firm ground is the novel possible but the dead weight of the actual is too heavy for us we cannot synthesize the results of experience we gather observations but we are unable to make artistic productions out of them thus we have a new atlantis and the book is historically significant just for this reason which is little more than a jumble of personal scandal filled in with occasional false incidents and mendacious details an orinoco which is rather a fanciful biography than a tale we have a wife's resentment a fair jilt and a lucky mistake stories all of which are based more or less exclusively on historic occurrences or on events that had come under the direct observation of the relators even where there is a lack of truth the appearance of truth is still carefully preserved things which have not actually happened are nevertheless related as facts real characters are put through unreal incidents the novel is supposed to give history fiction and falsehood are as yet confused with this brief summary of the qualities and shortcomings of our two women novelists this little paper might properly close but it may be interesting if having carried our inquiry thus far we add a paragraph about the way in which the rigid reality of the works at which we have been glancing grew gradually out into the genuine realism of the later novel properly to understand this tendency towards an equilibrium between fact and imagination we should turn aside to examine the profound influence exerted over the fiction of the time of the tatler and the spectator but for our present purposes we shall find the movement forward clearly enough exemplified in the work of one man the author of robinson crusoe whose writings therefore we will take as our clue beginning with the production of history or semi-history in which real characters slightly exaggerated move through real scenes or through scenes to but small extent imaginary defoe proceeded little by little to import more of fiction into his narrative to the detriment of the small substratum of truth still retained by and by he did no more than preserve the mere framework of history as in the journal of the plague year and uh, the memoirs of a cavalier in which most of the characters and many of the incidents are purely fictitious after this the remaining element of truth was gradually eliminated and he reached the production of narratives of fictitious characters in fictitious settings and among fictitious scenes from writing biographies with real names attached to them says professor minto in his life of defoe it was but a short step to writing biographies with fictitious names even when that short step was taken the artifices resorted to by him to preserve the apparent truthfulness of his narrations show us that he was by no means satisfied that it would be desirous to let matters of fact slip out of his work entirely though what he wrote was false he still tried to palm it off upon the world as true this makes the writing of defoe more like lying than fiction and goes far to explain the extraordinary minuteness of the circumstantial method adopted by him but it marks also the transitional quality of his work as mr leslie stephen has neatly put it defoe's novels are simply history minus the facts only in his latest works do we find this pseudo-history making way for fiction proper and then we recognize in defoe the distinct forerunner of the great novelists of the eighteenth century but to follow this matter farther would take us beyond the due bounds already somewhat transgressed of our present study 
as we may now see the story of english fiction from the period of the anglo-french romance to the time of fielding and smollett is a long one and we have undertaken to deal with only one chapter here the chapter which tells of mrs bain and mrs manley of what they did and of what they failed to do that finished our task is at an end end of essay three part two essay four of idle hours in a library by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain essay four a glimpse of bohemia part one the bohemia with which the following pages are concerned is not that inland country of europe which green and shakespeare to the indignation of all right-minded commentators so generously endowed with the sea-coast we must at once dismiss from our minds all thought of prague and the czechs for the country into which we are about to offer a personally conducted excursion finds no place on our maps and no mention in our geographies our bohemia is in a word none other than the bohemia of paris the confines and landmarks of this strange country have fortunately for us been authoritatively established bohemia according to the painter marcel of whom we shall hear more anon and who certainly knew well what he was talking about is bounded on the north by hope work and gaiety on the south by necessity and courage on the west and east by calumny and the hospital yet it is just possible that these cryptic phrases may fail to convey to some readers any very definite geographical information since even rodolphe to whom they were first addressed is reported to have shrugged his shoulders and responded with a simple je ne comprends pas hence it may be well at the outset to attempt to describe as succinctly as possible the limits of that seductive land through which our road is now to lie this is far from being an easy task however often as the word bohemia is used in the broad sense here attached to it so many writers have coloured it with so many different shades of meaning that though we may understand vaguely its general significance it seems well-nigh impossible to bring it satisfactorily within the terms of a strict definition vive la bohème cries george sand at the end of her novel la dernière aldini and vive la bohème has found many an echo and re-echo in the pages of french literature down to the present day when it would seem that as a free and independent country bohemia is practically disappearing from the face of the earth but each one of the many explorers of this dark and mysterious corner of our modern world has brought back with him his own report of the territory and its inhabitants and these travellers stories by no means tally with one another to some it has seemed to be peopled by the lowest classes of those who as the phrase goes live upon their wits by beggars petty swindlers of all descriptions and men and women who through idleness or misfortune are unable to obtain a livelihood we will not say in honest ways but in any way that society chooses to recognize as honest to others the population has appeared to be composed of those who follow undignified and precarious careers as a cheapjack circus riders street conjurers acrobats bear trainers sword swallowers and itinerant mountebanks of kindred descriptions a third class of writers has made bohemia a regular sink of society the receptacle of all such outcasts and human abominations as eugene sue and his followers love to depict villains of the deepest dye vitriol throwers housebreakers assassins while to a fourth group this same domain has been the land of literature and the arts where philosophy and beer music and debt painting and hunger criticism and tobacco smoke combine to make life picturesque and inspiring a land the denizens of which either die of penury in the streets or the hospital uncared for unknown or living at last take their rightful places in the front rank among the painters composers and writers of their time wherein these various critics agree is in describing bohemia as a country lying on the outskirts of ordinary society and inhabited by those who cannot or will not 
yield to that society's conventions the failures or the incompatibles of decent modern civilization it is hardly worth while to try to decide as to what particular portion of this vast and complex community has the best right to a name which has thus been used with great elasticity of meaning it will be sufficient if we say at once that the phase of bohemian life with which we here purpose to deal is not that reflected in the romances of javier de montepin feval or sue our bohemia is the bohemia of art and letters and as our guide through this romantic region we will take the man who has drawn its life for us with such marvellous power and vividness henri murger himself the representative bohemian alike in the struggles and lurid contradictions of his career and alas in his early and tragic death to-day as of old every man who devotes himself to art with no other means of subsistence than art itself will be forced to tread the pathways of bohemia the majority of our contemporaries who display the most beautiful heraldry of art have been bohemians and in their calm and prosperous glory they often recall sometimes perhaps with regret the time when climbing the green slopes of youth they had no other fortune in the sunshine of their twenty years than courage which is the virtue of the young and hope which is the fortune of the poor for the uneasy reader for the timorous bourgeois for all those who can never have too many dots on the eyes of a definition we will repeat in the form of an axiom bohemia is the probation of artistic life it is the preface to the academy the hospital or the morgue thus writes murger in the preface to his immortal scenes de la vie de bohème and the words will be found to furnish a startling commentary upon the kind of life with which his volume deals a life made up of extraordinary contrasts of dazzling dreams and the most sordid of realities of hope alternating with despair of high talents ruined by reckless excesses of splendid promises defeated by the fates of brilliant careers cut short by premature death the true bohemians continues this writer who more than any other speaks as their accredited mouthpiece and historian are really the called of art and stand a chance of being also the chosen but the country of their adoption literally bristles with dangers chasms yawn on either side misery and doubt yet between these two chasms there is at least a road leading to a goal which the bohemians can already reach with their eyes while awaiting the time when they shall touch it with their hands but till such time shall come even if it ever comes at all the young enthusiast must turn a brave face upon all the troubles the anxieties the privations the fears the petty worries and distractions by which his self-chosen career will be everywhere begirt for those who have once set their feet in the alluring but perilous pathway which will lead to fame or misery to immortality or death there must be no trembling no hesitation no looking backward with regretful eyes to the safe though humble beaten tracks which they have left below they have dared to devote themselves brain and soul to art in a world which cannot understand their aims which sneers at their aspirations which is very likely to leave them to starve and will at best yield them only a grudging and tardy welcome hence every day's existence becomes for them a work of genius an ever-recurring problem nor is it surprising that in the haphazard life which they are thus forced to lead they should inevitably acquire those habits of carelessness that easy-going morality and often enough that want of settled purpose which make them the black sheep of respectable society if a little good fortune falls into their hands they forthwith begin to pursue the most ruinous fancies not finding windows enough to throw their money out of and then when the last exu is dead and buried they begin again to dine at the table d'hote of chance where their cover is always laid and to chase from morning till night that ferocious beast the hundred sous piece such is the tenor of their way certainly not a noiseless one nor one running through the cool sequestered vale of life 
little wonder then that with all the frivolities and uncertainties of their journey with all its physical hardships and moral perils so few should survive their pilgrimage through bohemia or when they finally reach a quieter resting-place should have the heart to recount with frankness and simplicity their varied experiences in the probationary land yet the bohemians are a great race and may boast a proud extraction the founder of their illustrious family was none other than the great father of western song who living by chance from day to day wandered about the fertile country of ionia eating the bread of charity and stopping at eventide to hang beside the hearth of hospitality the harmonious lyre that had chanted the loves of helen and the fall of troy descending the centuries to modern times the bohemian reckons his ancestors among the prominent figures of every great literary epoch in the middle ages the great family tradition is perpetuated among the minstrels and ballad makers the devotees of the gay science the whole tribe of the melodious vagabonds of touraine while as we pass from the days of chivalry to the dawn of the renaissance we find bohemia still strolling about all the highways of the kingdom and already invading the streets of paris itself who does not know of pierre gringoire friend of vagrants and foe to fasting who cannot picture him as he beats the pavements of the town nose in air like a dog's sniffing the odours of the kitchens and the cookshops and jingling in imagination alas not in his pockets the ten crowns which the aldermen have promised him for the very pious and devout farce he has written for their theatre in the hall of the palais de justice who again does not recall master francois villon poet and vagabond par excellence whose ballads to-day may still make us forget the ruffian the vagabond the debauchee these are names with strange power still over the imagination and when we come to the splendid outburst of the renaissance is it not to find ourselves face to face with men in whose veins the rich old blood was fierce and strong with clement marot and the ill-starred tasso with jean goujon pierre ronsard mathurin regnier and who shall say how many more shakespeare and moliere jean jacques rousseau and d'alembert these too the historian of bohemia must include in his annals to say nothing of the long line of great writers in england whom merger does not even allude to by whom the name of grub street was made illustrious in the chronicles of the eighteenth century two groups of bohemians in paris where perhaps alone to-day artistic bohemianism is still possible have within more recent years made their voices heard and their influence felt in the literature and art of their time the first was that which gathered about poor gerard la Bruni, better known as gerard de nerval the unfortunate young writer whose works have yet to reap their due appreciation but whose translation of faust as goethe told eckermann made the great german proud to find such an interpreter that group was composed of such men as corot chesereau arsene Ose, Théophile gautier jules janin and stadler the mere recital of whose names is enough shortly after this band was broken up some like nerval dying tragically and long before their time others reaching high rank in the world of french letters another famous senegal arose the central figure of which was the prince of modern bohemia henri merger himself among those who toiled and suffered with him we may make passing mention of auguste vitu jean and alfred de delvaux but there were of course others whose names are less familiar to the reading public of to-day especially in this country the romance of this second bohemia has been written for us by merger in the science de la vie de bohème and it is to the pages of this fascinating book that we purpose presently to turn but to understand these aright to appreciate their pathos and their comedy to realize their intensity of meaning we must first of all know something of the writer's personality and career i do not mean that it will be necessary for us to retell in detail the whole sad story of murger's life 
but so much of his character and experiences find embodiment in this book of his that we should miss half its charm and more than half its significance if we did not to begin with make ourselves acquainted with at least the larger facts of his existence henri murger was born in eighteen twenty two his father a savoyard moved to paris either just before or just after his son's birth obtained a situation as janitor and while attending to the demands of this position carried on at the same time his trade as a tailor murger pere was a hard severe unsympathetic man totally unable to understand his son's early developed literary propensities and with no higher ambition in life than that of making a decent income by the exercise of his craft his intention from the beginning was to bring young henri up as an adept at shears and thimble so that he might by and by turn out a hard-working thrifty ninth part of a man like himself but henri rebelled and as his mother sided with him having as it would seem some faith in the child's talents or perhaps only a womanly yearning to make a gentleman of him the long struggle with paternal authority finally closed though not without the breeding of bitterness in his favour the original scheme of training him to manual labour was abandoned and he received such education as his parents could afford which after all was poor enough while still a mere boy he entered the practical business of life through the narrow and dingy portals of a lawyer's office but like many another youth under similar conditions the itch for verse was too strong for him and he relieved with the indicting of stanzas the dry technicalities of the legal routine meanwhile an academician m de jouy had taken a fancy to him and through his influence at the age of sixteen he obtained an appointment as secretary to count tolstoy a russian diplomatist then resident in paris forty francs a month represented the material advantages of this position not a lordly remuneration certainly but acceptable enough none the less more especially as the duties anything but cumbersome at the start dwindled considerably with lapse of time and presently became almost nominal with a small definite income to fall back upon and plenty of leisure on his hands murger now began to give free scope to his literary impulses passing his hours in the study of the poets and making a humble start in his own productive career but his good fortune was destined to be of short duration for through a rather ludicrous misadventure his connection with tolstoy was after a while brought to a sudden close at that time he was engaged to furnish a certain amount of daily copy to one of the parisian papers it so chanced that during the revolution of eighteen forty eight tolstoy found it necessary to put his secretarial services once more into active requisition and what with getting off his daily supply of matter for the press and preparing dispatches for the czar of all the rushes the young man unexpectedly found his energies taxed to the full one memorable day the functions of diplomatist and author unfortunately became entangled and in his hurry and excitement he sent off his feuilleton to the russian court and his dispatch to the corsair with this ill-timed performance murger's political career ignominiously ended and what was by far the most serious part of the matter the monthly recompense of forty francs which had seemed to him a veritable peruvian gold-mine ended also nor was this all ere this his mother had died and with the cessation of her mediatorial influence the feud between himself and his father had broken out afresh thus murger was thrown entirely on his own resources with nothing but his pen to look to for the means of support his father peremptorily refused to have anything to do with him he contents himself with giving me advice wrote henri to a friend in a season of special tribulation and with insulting me whenever we meet and it is well known that one cannot live on advice while insults though more stimulating are not a whit more nutritious it was at this point then that henri murger became a dweller in bohemia he was now one of those who in his own words have no other means of subsistence beyond that afforded by art itself 
one of those described by balzac whose religion is hope whose code is faith in oneself whose budget is charity through nearly all the varied experiences of which he was afterwards to write with such wonderfully sustained graphic power the young man himself now passed through the days of careless idleness or strenuous exertion through the nights of homeless wandering or furious dissipation through all the grim poverty and suffering all the doubt and restlessness all the fierce fluctuations of assurance and despair which presently went to the making of his book even while he had still been in receipt of count tolstoy's allowance things had sometimes gone hardly enough with him for needless to state he was not of the thrifty or frugal kind your friend he writes in a letter as early as eighteen forty one has found the means of swallowing forty francs in a fortnight but happily for him there are still forty sous left to carry him to the end of the month his existence then has been during the past fortnight diversified with beefsteaks and havana cigars while for the remaining two ill-omened weeks recourse must be had to that table d'hote of chance already referred to with the discontinuance of this tiny but periodic dropping from the great cornucopia of providence the beefsteaks and havana cigars became less and less frequent apparitions in his life and the famous inn which bears the belle étoile as its sign and trading token found in him a pretty constant guest to make his shoes last more than six months and his debts forever now became an urgent problem for him sometimes fortune would pay him a flying visit and on such occasions he describes himself as being temporarily in possession of more money than he knows what to do with but libraries tailors restaurants cafes theatres turkish tobacco pipes and friends combined to help him over this perplexing difficulty with extraordinary ease and rapidity once in the intense excitement of a sudden windfall he went to bed and dreamed that he was the emperor of morocco and was marrying the bank of france but such seasons of miraculous plenty were few and far between and visions of this extraordinary kind when they came at all were less likely to arise from repletion than from an empty stomach for sometimes he was brought face to face with actual starvation now he reports borrowing right and left from any acquaintance who had a franc to lend now again s is paying me the thirty francs he owes me fourteen sous at a time so from month to month he struggled on without seeming to get any nearer to the goal he had in view or in point of fact to any goal at all often tortured with physical pain and privation often driven half wild with despair but after the fashion of the true bohemian keeping always a brave heart and a ready jest for the good friends who stuck close to him through all and who would have been only too willing to help him in his need but for the single unfortunate circumstance that they were as badly off as himself unhappily murger was in one important respect particularly ill-adapted for the kind of life into which he was thus driven a man who trusts to his pen for daily bread should at least be a facile and ready writer able to turn off indefinite quantities of copy in a given time and willing to undertake the writing up of any subject upon which public interest may temporarily be aroused and an article required when literature becomes a business the higher ambition to produce only good work must almost inevitably be subordinated to the lower and more practical aim of making the thing pay now the difficulty with murger was that although literature was his livelihood his regular trade and calling he persistently refused to regard it mainly in that light refused to sacrifice artistic excellence to temporary advantage and to debase a sacred mission into mere routine work the immediate if not indeed the sole object of which was to turn so much intellectual labour into so much food and clothing he himself has remarked concerning one of his characters that after the fashion of genius a generalization which may or may not be partially true he had a tendency to be lazy murger was not exactly lazy but he was whimsical and uncertain his energies were not always under command and he did not with anthony trollope 
put firmer faith in a piece of beeswax on the seat of his chair than in all the promptings of the divine efflatus like goldsmith he recognized that the conditions of his life rendered it impossible for him to pay court to the draggle-tail muses they would simply have left him to starve outright so he turned to prose but with prose things were nearly as bad there were times when he could not and would not write when the spirit was not upon him and when he could not work as an artist he would not work as a day-laborer or publisher's drudge and even when he was in full swing his delicate taste his almost morbid care in composition his constant desire to do his best prevented him from ever producing with the rapidity necessary to make the results really remunerative never even under the greatest stress of circumstances would he consent to write hastily or allow his manuscript to leave his hands without what he conceived to be its proper share of thought and revision money to him was always the secondary consideration even hunger had to wait that the artistic sense might be satisfied rather than prove traitor to his lofty ideals he would live for weeks on dry bread thus he had more than the usual difficulty in making ends meet but the misfortune did not stop there a slow and exceedingly painstaking writer he could produce but little in the normal hours of work hence the limit had to be frequently extended and for this purpose recourse was had to the perilous aid of artificial stimulants we now touch the saddest part of murger's sad story he rode at night and generally in bed a practice which he had probably adopted in days when fuel was a luxury beyond his reach and his work was almost invariably done with the assistance of strong and incessant potations of coffee when the house was perfectly quiet when darkness and silence had fallen over the city then murger like balzac commenced the labors of the day with these desperate measures there can be little doubt that he began very early to undermine a constitution which had never been robust the story of the habits thus formed and of the tyranny they acquired over him is a terribly tragic one and might furnish a fearful warning to many a jaded brain-worker did we not know that it is the everlasting law of human nature that no one shall profit by any one else's experiences i am literally killing myself he writes to a friend you must break me of coffee i count on you there are nights he declares at another time when i have consumed as much as six ounces of coffee and only end by convincing myself more than ever of my lack of power and this yes this has lasted three months so that at present i am broken down by the application of these mochas and here i am still passing my nights drinking coffee like voltaire and smoking like jean bart as a direct consequence of these suicidal habits he gradually contracted a terrible disease known to medicine as purpura which took him again and again to the hospital once when the hand of sickness had smitten him with more than usual severity he made a determined attempt to reform he banished his coffee and strove by closing the shutters and lighting the candles to trick himself into working not of course by daylight but simply during the day but it was too late to inaugurate so radical a change ere long his nocturnal instincts reasserted themselves and continued in full force to the end of his career doubtless it is in the pathological conditions thus brought about that we have to seek the explanation of the fearful restlessness which presently came to characterize him and which earned for him the nickname of the wandering christian it was only after his constitution had been shattered and he had grown prematurely old that murger found his way out of bohemia the path into the land of glamour and enchantments had been easy enough like the road to avernus the passage back again into the common world was in his case as in the case of so many others a steep and difficult one but after months and years of toil and waiting success came at last and little by little he was able to break with tenacious old associations and settle down to a more steady and regular routine of life 
he established a connection with a revue des deux mondes and with a position now practically assured took up his abode at marlotte near fontainebleau here he had every chance of restoring his enfeebled health and starting his career anew upon a different and a wiser plan but the hour had gone by a brief period of work and quiet happiness was brought to a close in january eighteen sixty one when henri murger breathed his last in the house where he had already spent so many weeks of suffering in the hôpital saint louis he had not completed his thirty-ninth year of the general work of murger this is not the place to speak it is considerable in quantity and much of it has substantial claim to critical attention for his prose is finely wrought and his lyrics instance the superb chanson de musette so highly but justly praised by gautier are sometimes of rare purity and sweetness but it is by the scenes of bohemian life and by these alone after all that murger keeps his hold to-day upon the broader reading public it has been said that he only wrote at his best when he was writing straight out of his own life this is perhaps at bottom the reason why this one singular book possesses vitality far in excess of all his other productions these may still be read with enjoyment though in the tremendous stress of modern affairs and with the ceaseless activity of the printing press they are more likely to be ignored by all but special students but the scenes of bohemian life as mr saintsbury has rightly insisted take a permanent place in the literature of humanity here we may notice one more illustration of the curiously distorted judgments which authors often pass upon their own works in later years he was accustomed to speak slightingly and almost petulantly of the volume which has carried his name over into a new generation even it is said going so far as to affirm that that devil of a book will hinder me from ever crossing the pont des arts that is from entering the academy which was one of the unfulfilled ambitions of his life but in another and finer sense it has placed his name among those of the immortals we may now pass from the author to his volume on the title page of which he might well have written the famous quorum pars magna fui of virgil's hero murger c'est la bohème comme la bohème fou murger was the declaration of one of his personal friends and the stuff of his wonderful scenes with all their extravagance and rollicking absurdity with all their poignant pathos and whimsical humour is as we have said stuff furnished by close observation and intimate experience though the crude material is transmuted into gold by the secret alchemy of genius it has been said that many of murger's chapters were actually written in the french phrase for which we have no satisfactory equivalent au jour le jour that he made the scenes of his bohemian life into literature so to speak while they were still being enacted to this effect théophile de banville reported that which was done by rodolphe who as we shall presently see is generally to be identified with murger himself during the month when he was mademoiselle mimi's neighbour has perhaps had no parallel since letters began his days he passed in composing verses sketching plots of plays and covering mimi's hands with kisses as with a glove but his daily bread was his feuilleton for the corsair and as rodolphe had neither money nor books to invent anything but his own life each evening he wrote as a feuilleton for the corsair the life of that day and each day he lived the feuilleton for the next it was thus that the morrow of i know not what quarrel after the fashion of the lovers of horace mimi leaning on her lover's arm was bowed to in the luxembourg by the poet of the feuille d'automne and returned home quite proud of the rue des canettes and that same evening rodolphe wrote on this theme one of his most delightful chapters this account of the connection between murger's book and his daily life probably overstates the matter or is to be accepted as appropriately true only in regard to exceptional occurrences like the one directly referred to 
but that the substance of the volume was throughout furnished by experience is certain the principal characters and even some of the minor ones have long since been traced back to their archetypes the spots rendered famous by many a memorable scene such as the cafe momus and the shop of the old jewish bric-a-brac dealer father medicis are known to have actually existed in the old latin quarter though in the evolution of modern paris the historic landmarks have been swept away while there is no question that in most of his stories murger either drew immediately upon actual circumstances or at least built his superstructure of fancy upon a very solid foundation of fact the heroes of the scenes of bohemian life are four in number to each member of the strange group the quatois murger as it came to be called we will yield the honour of a separate paragraph or two of characterization first we have alexander schaunard who though he cultivates the two liberal arts of painting and music devotes the larger part of his attention to the latter and is indeed particularly engaged at the time when we make his acquaintance in the composition of an elaborate symbolic symphony which might almost be said to anticipate some of the crazy theories of more recent doctrinaires representing as it does the influence of blue in the arts this strange production had a real existence and its originator in the book has been identified with alexander schaun who also drove an artistic tandem with much enthusiasm for a season though he subsequently forsook bohemia and adopted a more profitable career in the toy-making business he and murger became acquainted in eighteen forty one lived together at one time in the closest intimacy in the rue de la Habe, and remained friends till the latter's death schaun survived among new faces other minds till eighteen eighty seven and only a short time before he died published some memoirs which contain many matters of interest for the murger student he bore among his companions the nickname of schaunard sauvage and in murger's original manuscript the name was so written schaunard by a printer's error however the first n was turned into a u and the historian thought well in reading the proof to let the blunder pass schaunard in the book is specially distinguished among his acquaintances for having raised borrowing to the level of a fine art by dint of many careful observations and delicate experiments he has discovered the days when each one of his friends is accustomed to receive money and thus following the periodic ebb and flow of the financial tide spares himself the trouble and annoyance of appealing to the generosity of those who at the given moment are likely to be in as low water as himself having furthermore learned the way to borrow five francs in all the languages of the globe the painter musician is able as a rule to keep pretty firmly on his feet by a critical friend he was once described as passing one half of his time in looking for money to pay his creditors and the other half in eluding his creditors when the money has been found but it should be remembered that this calls for some discount as a friend's judgment and likely therefore to be a trifle overcoloured and it is but doing justice to schaunard to say that towards the immediate companions who had come to his rescue from time to time he behaved upon a more honourable plan to facilitate and at the same time to equalize so far as possible the taxes which he levied he had drawn up in order of districts and streets an alphabetical list containing the names of all his friends and acquaintances opposite each name was inscribed the maximum sum which having regard to their state of fortune he might borrow from them the times when they were in funds their dinner hour and the ordinary bill of fare of the house beside this list schaunard kept in perfect order a little ledger in which he entered the amounts lent to him down to the minutest fraction for he would never go beyond a certain figure which was within the fortune of a norman uncle whose heir he was as soon as he owed twenty francs to an individual he closed the account and liquidated it at a single payment even if for the purpose he had to borrow from others to whom he owed less in this way he always kept up a certain credit which he called his floating debt and as people knew that he was accustomed to pay when his personal resources permitted they willingly obliged him when they could 
Chonard plays his part to the amusement, if not always to the edification, of the reader in many delightful episodes in the scenes. It is through his misadventures with his landlord that the establishment of the club is largely, though indirectly, brought about. It is he who paints the provincial Blangeron's portrait in fancy dressing gown, while Marcel goes off to dine with a deputy in his, the said Blancheron's, coat it is he again who is hired by an englishman to play the piano from morning till night as a means of getting even with an actress living near by whose parrot and shrill declamation combined have proved rather too much for even british nerves a transaction out of which we need scarcely add the virtuoso made a good deal more money than he did from his famous symphony on the whole however of the four friends with whose doings our volume is mainly occupied schaunard is by far the least attractive figure he is coarse and morose has a harsh rasping voice is apt to be put out about trifles sometimes treats his male friends with scant courtesy and has an unpleasant habit of employing with his more intimate associates of the other sex captain marriott's argumentum ad feminam in other words of conversing with them occasionally through the medium of a stout cane poor famille the melancholy famille had every right more than once or twice to complain of the strength and efficacy of his logic nor were matters made very much better for her we may opine when after one of their quarrels he gave her in a grim joke and as a keepsake the stick with which he had addressed to her so many telling remarks End of essay four, part one. essay four of idle hours in a library by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain essay four a glimpse of bohemia part two after schaunard comes marcel the painter a character of more amiable type who appears to be a compound portrait of the two artists tabar and lazar he is essentially a good fellow bright enthusiastic happy-go-lucky and shiftless and though after the fashion of the world in which he lives he has an insolent confidence in luck he is manly enough upon occasion to give fortune a helping hand he is the hero of many amazing and some very ludicrous adventures of which we can find space here only for a single specimen like schaunard he is devoting as much of his time and energy as he can save from the manufacture of pot-boilers and the consideration of the terrible daily problem of how to get breakfast to the composition of one great work which is to be his open sesame to fame the passage of the red sea was ever so much labor expended with such little practical result one may wonder by any artist whatsoever painter musician or poet for five or six years marcel had worked away at his canvas with unflagging diligence and courage and for five or six years this masterpiece of colour had been obstinately refused by the jury so that by dint of going and returning from the artist's studio to the exhibition and from the exhibition back to the studio the picture had come to know the way so well that had it been set on wheels it could have gone to the louvre by itself marcel of course attributed the policy of the jury to the personal spite of its members and persisted in the teeth of all discouragement in regarding his production as the pendant to the marriage in cana hence nothing daunted he returned again and again to his vast design after indulging in a sufficient amount of abuse to relieve his ruffled temper at length under conviction that the child of this world might possibly succeed where the child of light had failed he began to seek for means whereby without altering the general plan of his gigantic undertaking he might deceive the jury in supposing it to be an entirely fresh and hitherto unexamined work thus one year he turned pharaoh into caesar and the passage of the red sea became the passage of the rubicon this ruse failing he covered as by miracle the red sea with snow 
planted a fir tree in one corner thereof dressed an egyptian in the costume of the imperial guard and sent forth his canvas as the passage of the beresina but unfortunately the jury had wiped its glasses that day and was not to be duped it recognized the inexorable picture by dint of a multicolored horse his synoptic table of fine colors marcel privately called this astonishing steed that went prancing about on the top of a wave of the red sea and again the masterpiece was churlishly blackballed till my dying day i will send my picture to the judges vowed marcel after this new repulse it shall be engraved on their memories the surest way of ever getting it engraved remarked colline who chanced to be near by and so the poor painter might have been left to try further and still wilder experiments but for the kindly intervention of daddy medicis an old jew who had constant dealings with the bohemians and often managed to do them a friendly turn without as may be imagined sacrificing himself overmuch in the transaction this singular individual coming one evening to marcel's room offered to purchase the famous picture for the collection of a rich amateur and proposed one hundred and fifty francs as a fair price at first the artist grumbled there was at least a hundred and fifty francs worth of cobalt in the dress of pharaoh alone he protested but the jew stood firm and at last the painter yielded whereupon daddy medicis gave the bohemians a dinner at which the lobster ceased to be a myth for schaunard who contracted for this amphibious creature a passion bordering on madness as for marcel himself his intoxication came near upon having deplorable results passing his tailor's shop at two o'clock in the morning he actually wanted to wake up his creditor and give him on account the hundred and fifty francs he had just received a ray of reason which still flitted in the mind of colline stopped the artist on the brink of this precipice and now for the sequel of the story a week after these festivities marcel found out the gallery in which his picture had been placed in passing through the faubourg saint honore he stopped in the midst of a group which seemed to be watching with curious interest a sign that was being placed over a shop this sign was neither more nor less than marcel's picture which had been sold by medicis to a grocer only the passage of the red sea had undergone one more change and bore a new name a steamboat had been added and it was now called the harbour of marseilles the curious onlookers when they saw the picture burst out in a flattering ovation and marcel returned home in ecstasy over the triumph murmuring the voice of the people is the voice of god what part the synoptic charger was now called on to fill unfortunately we cannot say the third member of our quartet is gustave colline student of hyperphysical philosophy and inveterate perpetrator of alarming puns he too is a composite character the principal ingredients of his make-up being furnished by two of merger's old associates jean walton and trapadou both of whom were men of immense and curious erudition and many eccentricities colline himself of a somewhat more steady way of life than his companions gains a fairly regular income by teaching mathematics botany arabic and various other subjects as occasion demands and spends the greater part of it in the accumulation of second-hand books what he did with all these volumes remarks the historian so numerous that the life of a man would never have sufficed to read them no one knew he least of all but still he goes on adding tome to tome and when he chances to return to his lodgings at night without bringing a new specimen to his store he feels that like the good titus he has wasted his day thus his strange shapeless mouth pouting lips double chin shaggy light hair and threadbare hazel-coloured overcoat are well known upon the quays and wherever ancient volumes are exposed for sale his tastes are catholic in the extreme for he will buy anything and everything that is to be bought provided only it is rare out of the way and for all practical purposes useless 
some idea of the range and versatility of his interest may be given by reference to a single episode in his history when in company with marcel rodolphe gave that famous christmas entertainment whereof the record is to be found in its proper place in the annals of bohemia he insisted on borrowing for the occasion the philosopher's famous swallowtail coat now this coat as the chronicler justly suggests deserves a word or two by courtesy it was held to be black by candlelight though it was really of a decided blue it was also cut upon a wild and startling plan very short in the waist and exceedingly long in the tails but its most astonishing features were the pockets positive gulfs in which colleen was accustomed to lodge some thirty of the volumes which he everlastingly carried about with him which caused his friends to say that during the times when the libraries were closed scientists and men of letters could always seek information in the skirts of colleen's coat a library always open to readers well on this particular day strange to relate the great swallowtail apparently harbored only a quarto volume of bailey a treatise in three volumes on the hyperphysical faculties a volume of condillac two of swedenborg and pope's essay on man hello exclaimed rodolphe when the philosopher had turned out this odd collection and allowed the other to don the imposing habit the left pocket still feels very heavy there is still something in it ah replied colleen that is true i forgot to empty the foreign language pocket whereupon he drew out two arabic grammars a malay dictionary and the perfect stock breeder in chinese his favourite reading nor was this quite all later on in looking for his handkerchief rodolphe came accidentally upon a small tartar volume overlooked in the department of foreign literature for the rest colleen is a very agreeable companion pleasant of manner and courteous of bearing and his conversation is amusingly spiced with quaint technical expressions and the most outrageous puns unlike his three companions who are in perpetual bondage to love he passes on for the most part in bachelor meditation fancy free as becomes a philosopher of the hyperphysical school once in a while we find him flirting a little with the bon ami of one of his friends and we recall a single occasion on which according to his own statement he had an appointment of a romantic character we read also in the most incidental way of his devotion to a waistcoat-maker whom he keeps day and night copying the manuscripts of his philosophical works but at these as at all other times the lady of his affections remains invisible and anonymous in general it may be said that he shows himself markedly superior to the human weakness which does so much to disturb the byways of bohemia no less than the highways of the outer world music painting and philosophy are thus well represented in the bohemian seneca and in rodolphe the last of the group the sister art of poetry finds a worthy exponent rodolphe is the real hero of the book and is indeed an approximately faithful sketch of the author himself in the fancy poet of the latin quarter the man who in the very cut of his clothes manners appearance conversation confessed his association with the muses many of murger's well-known traits of character and personal idiosyncrasies are frankly reproduced we have a brief but sufficiently detailed description of him when he makes his first appearance in the cafe momus and there can be no doubt as to the artist's model from which the study is made he is presented as a young man whose face was almost lost in an enormous thicket of many-coloured beard but as a set-off against this abundance of hair on the chin a precocious baldness had dismantled his forehead which looked like a knee and the nakedness of which a few stray hairs that one might have counted vainly endeavoured to cover he wore a black coat tonsured at the elbows and with practical ventilators under the armpits which could be seen whenever he raised his arms too high his trousers might once have been black but his shoes which had never been new seemed to have several times made the tour of the world on the feet of the wandering jew in all this in the precocious baldness and parti-coloured beard especially we have the historian of bohemia himself 
we do not therefore wonder that the character of rodolphe should stand out from among the other figures of the scenes by reason of a certain autobiographic distinctness of outline and colour nor that he should prevail upon us by a kind of personal charm which his companions rarely possess to follow rodolphe's various adventures and enterprises back to their originals in murger's life would be an interesting task but it is one that cannot be attempted here and for the time being we must keep to the poet in the book like his friend chalnard and marcel this young man has pinned his faith to one ambitious work a drama called the avenger which has already gone the round of all the theatres of paris and of which in the course of a couple of years he has accumulated a dozen or so huge manuscript copies weighing collectively something like fifteen pounds the avenger was ultimately produced and ran for five successive nights after large portions of these carefully wrought versions had been used up in the humble service of lighting the fire but this does not come till towards the end of the story and during the days when we know him best rodolphe awaiting his dramatic triumph is willing enough to turn his literary talents to account in less dignified ways the main sources of his income appears to be the scarf of iris a fashion journal and the castor a paper devoted to the interest of the hat trade both of which he edits and in which he publishes from time to time his opinions on tragedy and kindred subjects it is to the columns of the latter periodical by the by that gustave colline contributes a discussion on the philosophy of hats and other things in general how much to the amusement and instruction of its readers we are unfortunately not told probably the financial advantages of these two undertakings are of a rather slight and unsubstantial character at any rate the editor-in-chief shows himself at all times ready to supplement his official emoluments whensoever occasion offers witness his most famous piece of hack-work the composition of the perfect chimney constructor rodolphe who has been sadly down on his luck for a time fluctuating between going to bed without supper and supping without going to bed happens accidentally to run across his uncle monetti a stove-maker and physician of smoky chimneys whom he has not seen for an age now m monetti is an enthusiast in his art and has conceived the idea of drawing up for the benefit of future generations a manual of chimney construction in which his own numerous patents shall be given adequate presentation finding his nephew fallen upon evil days he entrusts him with this literary enterprise promising him a remuneration of three hundred francs and rashly giving him outright fifty francs on account of course rodolphe incontinently disappears and only turns up again when the money has disappeared also uncle monetti then resorts to drastic measures he locks the volatile young gentleman in a small room six stories up with stoves and ovens for his company and takes away his clothes leaving in their stead a ridiculous turkish dressing-gown in this attic solitude the unfortunate young poet is fain to wax eloquent over ventilators till he is rescued in the most romantic way by a certain mademoiselle sidonia as the reader will find recorded at length in its proper place in the bohemian chronicles in connection with one extraordinary episode in rodolphe's career his sudden receipt of five hundred francs in hard cash we have an excellent opportunity of studying some of the mysteries of bohemian finance he and marcel who was then his fellow lodger regarded this colossal sum as practically inexhaustible they were not a little surprised therefore to find before a fortnight had gone by that it had vanished into air as though by magic the strictest frugality had presided over all their expenditures and the question was where in the world the money could have gone to into this problem the two economists forthwith made inquisition analyzing their accounts and carefully weighing them item by item this is about the way in which the audit was conducted march nineteen received five hundred francs paid one turkish pipe twenty-five francs dinner fifteen francs miscellaneous expenses forty francs marcel read out 
what in the world are these miscellaneous expenses asked rodolphe you know well enough said the other it was the evening when we didn't come home till morning at any rate that saved us fuel and candles there is nothing like rigid economy as we see march twenty breakfast one franc fifty centimes tobacco twenty centimes dinner two francs an opera glass needed by rodolphe who as editor of the scarf of iris had to write a notice of an art exhibition and so on and so on as the account continued miscellaneous expenses reappeared with ever-increasing frequency indeed the two financiers had in the end to admit that this vague and perfidious title as rodolphe called it had proved a delusion and a snare such then are the four principal characters with whose doings and misdoings the scenes of bohemian life are mainly occupied a word only about the women of the book it is while he is in their company i suppose more than at any other time that the anglo-saxon reader feels how far the pathways of bohemia lie outside the boundaries of respectable society louise the fickle bird of passage musette vagabond and careless mimi charming heartless ill-fated femi beneath whose delicate exterior was concealed a veritable volcano of passion yes the face of the moralist will certainly harden as he dwells on the giddy vagrancy of their lives and the hopeless tragedy in which the music and the laughter inevitably find their earthly close about this matter i shall try to say something presently for the moment i want only to point out that though the women of murger's book are drawn from known or conjectured originals the portraiture does not seem to be nearly as close as it is throughout in the case of the men this does not mean only that each girl in the scenes is a more or less blurred compound of various famous figures of the old latin quarter it means also and this is of course far more important that the characters have undergone much transfiguration the magic and grace by which amid all their personal shortcomings and delinquencies these heedless adventurers of the studio and the cafe are actually marked are largely it is to be feared the results of murger's own idealizing imagination and delicately poetic touch there is an important point suggested by the present part of our subject which demands a moment's attention the principle indicated in the well-known lines of la fontaine deux coqs vivent en paix une poule servent et voilà la guerre illumée is generally held to be one of universal applicability but the life of our bohemian brotherhood for once gives it the lie direct never even in the most trying seasons of love and jealousy did the tie slacken which bound the four companions colline the great philosopher marcel the great painter schaunard the great musician and rodolphe the great poet as they called one another rodolphe and mimi might lead a cat and dog life marcel might quarrel with musette and make it up only to quarrel again schaunard might see fit to address some of his telling observations to the person of the melancholy femi but artist and poet philosopher and painter rubbed on together in peace and if the truth must be told smoked many a pipe in company over the grave of their dead passions truly the domestic side of their life left much to be desired at one time they all occupied the same house and then the unfortunate neighbors lived as it were on a volcano six months went by things grew daily more and more intolerable and then the final breaking up of the establishment came about but adds murger and the remark exhibits clearly the kind of understanding which existed among the strangely assorted friends in this association despite the three young and pretty women who formed part of it no sign of discord appeared among the men they frequently gave way to the most absurd caprices of their mistresses but not one of them would have hesitated a moment between the woman and the friend amid all the uncertainties and anxieties the follies and the vices of their daily life these brother bohemians are possessed of a very keen and genuine enthusiasm for art and of a sturdy faith in themselves and their own high calling 
this is one good aspect of their character another and complementary aspect upon which murger lays much stress is their complete freedom from stiff-necked virtuosity and dilettante affectations there are bohemians who chatter only of art for art's sake who hold with inflexible obstinacy and stoical pride to the narrow path they have marked out for themselves who scorn to descend upon any pretext for any purpose whatsoever to the plane of common affairs but murger takes pains to make it clear that rodolphe and his friends do not belong to this unfortunate class the bouvies do as they are called the first tenet of whose creed is that no one of their number on penalty of expulsion from the society shall accept any work outside pure art itself rodolphe as we know is working hard upon his great tragedy marcel upon his passage of the red sea schoenard upon his symbolic symphony colline upon his system of hyperphysical philosophy but there are no cant phrases of art worship everlastingly upon their lips and they are ready enough to turn their energies when opportunity offers into more remunerative if less ambitious undertakings we have seen something already of the practical means sometimes adopted by them of putting a figure before the cipher which unfortunately as a rule constitutes their entire available capital if further evidence be demanded we need only refer to the occasions when rodolphe versifies an epitaph for an inconsolable widow and turns off a rhyming advertisement for a dentist and when marcel paints eight grenadiers at six francs apiece likenesses guaranteed for a year like a watch of the scenes of bohemian life as a whole it would be hopeless to endeavour to give any general idea within the limits of a rapid sketch it is little to say that from cover to cover of this wonderful book there is not a dull or indifferent page not a page that does not teem with quaint description brilliant bits of characterization vivid pictures of manners and life of the range and opulence of its humour some hint has perhaps been given though the merest hint only in the personal delineation attempted above mirth compelling the scenes certainly are and we feel in their case as we cannot always feel with the masterpieces of the french comic genius that the laughter they provoke is generous hearty wholesome laughter without taint of cynicism or spite but the humour of the volume rich and racy as it is and the ebullient wit which glitters and flashes in its dialogues and incidental touches of comment and criticism are not by any means the only qualities that deserve attention murger was a true humorist and like all true humorists he had the keenest realization of the pathos and tragedy of life the most delicate apprehension of the sense of tears in mortal things though it can hardly be said of the scenes of bohemian life as it has been rightly said of the great body of the author's work that the dominant note is one of poignant melancholy the minor chords are heavy and frequent enough to tone down the exuberant gaiety of the volume and to cause the final impression left by it to be rather sombre than exhilarating murger saw much of the reckless and irresponsible life of the latin quarter on its grotesque side and he has given this side extraordinary prominence in this particular book reserving many of the harsher features which from personal contact he knew equally well for the scenes de la vie de jeunesse and the bouvier d'eau but the reader who follows to their close the chapters we have here more especially been considering and who can put them down unfinished will find that their brilliancy of light and colour are thrown up against a very dark background and that the shadows gather and deepen about us as the story runs its course at length the wild music ceases altogether the mad laughter is silenced and the book is laid by not with a burst of final merriment but with a gulp and a pang ah comme nous avons ri yes the struggles the privations the absurdities of bohemia are comical enough but life is stern even in this land of romance there is death in it and many a heartbreak and if we escape the suffering of failure we must accept the inevitable disillusion of success 
life too is fleeting the golden sands slip through our fingers as we try to clutch them et here figasse it is the old world burden that we must needs end with la jeunesse n'a qu'un no ce n'est pas gai tous les jours la bohème for my own part i know not whether one could turn to find pages of purer tenderness and pathos than those in which murger has written of francine's muff and of the death of poor little mimi and yet there is no effort no melodramatic striving after effect the lips quiver the eyes grow dim as we read but so admirably is the art concealed so perfect is the reserve under which it is all done that it is only when we come to turn back over the chapters for the express purpose of analyzing them that we begin to realize the author's exquisite perception and tact and the genius with which he carries his meaning straight home to our hearts poor francine poor mimi these fragile slips of womanhood from the dingy old latin quarter are filled with the life that the poet alone can give we meet them once in a few pages of print and their hungry eyes and poor worn faces linger with us for ever and now we must revert for a moment to a question already touched on the loose morality not infrequently charged against this record of bohemian life i promised that i should try to say something about this matter ere i brought these jottings to a close but now that it is definitely before us i do not feel after all that there is very much to be said our judgment on such a book as this ethically considered must certainly depend on the point of view from which we regard it and this point of view will always be at bottom so much an affair of temperament outlook training bias that it is not likely to be much affected by any arguments adverse or favourable certainly Mugere once imagines one of his readers saying i shall not allow this story to fall into the hands of my daughter to this doubtless most anglo-saxon fathers would say amen and there is little question that they would on the whole be wise in so doing i readily admit that it would be better that the perusal of such a work as this as of many other great and enduring pieces of literature should be left for those whose minds have been schooled and sobered by the discipline of real life and who are thus in a position to bring murger's imaginary scenes with all their bewitching humour magic of description and charm of style to the touchstone of actual experience but while i concede this much i cannot for a moment go with those who would therefore place the volume on their official index expurgatorius on the score that it will be found dangerous to morality such a notion seems to me simply absurd and due to an entire misapprehension of what it is in literature that renders it injurious in its effects murger drew his material from a world he had known and lived in and he incorporates all its irregularities of conduct and very much of its wantonness yet i challenge any intelligent and broad-minded reader to deny that the atmosphere of his sins is almost always fresh and wholesome those at least who know something of the french novel from la dame aux camélias onward and of some of the english fiction produced within recent decades by writers who boldly claim place in the ranks of the moralists will hardly feel called upon to attack our author on this particular head nowhere let it be said emphatically does murger deliberately give himself up to the worship of the great goddess of lubricity nowhere does he willingly throw the halo of poetry over mere physical passion nowhere does he go out of his way to show vice as vice in glowing or attractive colours these may read like phrases of the most conventional criticism but they are here thoroughly to the point the very story which the writer stops short for a moment to interject the imaginary comment quoted above is as pure and delicate as a love story well could be and only a reader capable of sucking poison out of a lily could be disturbed in the slightest degree by the irregularity of the relations existing between jacques and poor francine 
it can never be often urged that in such a case as this perhaps in all art whatsoever the one fundamentally essential thing is treatment and with murger's handling of his theme no possible fault could be found even by the most austere and exacting critic a more substantial charge may i think be brought against the scenes on the ground that in their delightful pages the shiftless improvident hand-to-mouth existence of rodolphe and his friends is made too engaging and seductive are there not it may be asked scores of young men who believe that they have in very large capitals a genius and a mission in art and who need nothing but the incentive of such a volume as this to lead them to throw aside the sober concerns of law or commerce and voluntarily exchange a career of useful if monotonous toil for one wherein immediate misery is practically certain and ultimate success only a remote chance use of some sensibility and ambition who hate the counting-house and the desk who have written verses or made sketches which have been praised by injudicious friends and who have devoured the numerous biographies of those who having commenced life in uncongenial labour boldly kicked over the traces and finally made for themselves a position and a name are prone enough it may be alleged to mistake themselves for great men in embryo and to set up their backs against the daily routine and the common task without the aid of a book which paints bohemia so constantly on its pleasantest side and gives to even its struggles and sufferings a romantic charm which the jog-trot round of experience does not possess all this perhaps is true at any rate i have myself known one young fellow of the class referred to who under murger's inspiration played for a time at bohemianism allowed his hair to grow down over his shoulders wore by preference a threadbare coat and posed as an unappreciated genius his genius i believe remains unrecognized still but he has long since assumed a respectable garb and given other outward and visible signs of his perversion to conventionality and yet even with this instructive case well in mind i think too much might easily be made of the harmful tendencies of murger's book the sturm und drang period of youth the period of ferment and aimless experiment and general unrest will always be fraught with perils of one or another kind and a few wild dreams of vague ambition some spiritual green sickness an attack or two of the hysterics of social revolt a little affectation of byronism or shelleyism or mergerism are not the worst of these fortunately the real world is a business-like and remorseless disciplinarian and in the school of practical experience a nature essentially healthy will presently right itself and be none the worse perhaps even the better for a handful of battered illusions and some pricked bubbles of fancy and as for the natures not fundamentally healthy well life the schoolmistress has her own effectual way with these also but should there perchance be any young man in danger of taking the bohemian fever a trifle too seriously we will refer him for treatment to a very satisfactory physician a specialist one may say in the complaint murger himself properly read and read through to the end the scenes should prove their own corrective and if their full significance is not clear the preface furnishes the needed commentary it is but simple justice to murger to say that he himself had no sympathy whatever with the indefinite ambitions and mawkish sentimentalism of a certain class of young men who mistake the cravings of aspiration for the promptings of genius and turn to art because they are fit for nothing else again and again does he insist upon the stern realities of the artist's probation again and again does he raise the voice of warning to those who would rashly decide to commit themselves to the artist's career il en est donc le lutte de l'art à peu près comme à la guerre toute la gloire conquise régalée sur le nom des chefs 
l'armée se partage pour récompense les quelques lignes d'un ordre de jour quant aux soldats frappés dans le combat on les enterra là où ils sont tombés et un seul épitaphe suffit pour vingt mille morts these are solemn and uncompromising words and scarcely less solemn are the phrases in which he describes the life of bohemia as charming but terrible having its conquerors and its martyrs a life upon which no one should enter who is not prepared beforehand to submit to the inexorable law of va victus woe to the conquered indeed in the brilliant pages of the world's history the name and fortune of the one who succeeds alone are inscribed those of the nine hundred and ninety-nine who ignominiously and miserably fail pass into everlasting oblivion end of essay four part two end of idle hours in a library by william henry hudson